Hello, today we'll be starting in Chapter 7 in Prince Caspian, Old Narnia in Danger. The place where they had met the fawns was, of course, Dancing Lawn itself, and here Caspian and his friends remained till the night of the Great Council, to sleep under the stars, to drink nothing but well water, and to live chiefly on nuts and wild fruit was a strange experience for Caspian. After his bed with silken sheets in a tapestried chamber at the castle, with meals laid out on gold and silver dishes in the ant room and attendants ready at his call, but he had never enjoyed himself more. Never had sleep been more refreshing, nor too, food tasted more savory, and he began already to harden, and his face wore a kinglier look. When the great night came, and his various strange subjects came stealing into the lawn by ones and twos and threes, or by sixes and sevens, the moon then shining almost at her full, his heart swelled as he saw their number and heard their greetings. All whom he had met were there, bulgy bears and red dwarfs and black dwarfs, moles and badgers, hares and hedgehogs, and others whom he had not yet seen. Five satires as red as foxes, the whole contingent of talking mice armed to the teeth and following a shrill trumpet some owls, the old raven of Ravenscar, last of all, and this took Caspian's breath away, with the centers came a small but genuine giant, Wimbleweather of Deadman's Hill, carrying on his back a basketful of rather seasick dwarfs who had accepted his offer of a lift and were now wishing they had walked instead. The bulgy bears were very anxious to have the feast first and leave the council till afterwards, perhaps till tomorrow. Reepy Jeep and his mice said that councils and feasts could both wait and propose storming mirrors in his own castle that very night. Pattertwig and the other squirrels said they could talk and eat at the same time, so why not have the council and feast all at once? The moles proposed throwing up entrenchments round the lawn before they did anything else. The fawns thought it would be better to begin with a solemn dance. The old raven, while agreeing with the bears that it would take too long to have a full council before supper, begged to be allowed to give a brief address to the whole company. But Caspian and the centers and the dwarfs overruled all these suggestions and insisted on holding a real council of war at once. When all the other creatures had been persuaded to sit down quietly in a great circle, and when, with more difficulty, they got Pattertwig to stop running to and fro and saying, Silence! Silence, everyone, for the king's speech! Caspian, feeling a little nervous, got up. Narnians! he began, but he never got any further, for at that very moment Camillo the Hare said, Hush! There's a man somewhere near. They were all creatures of the wild, accustomed to being hunted, and they all became still as statues. The beasts all turned their noses in the direction which Camillo had indicated. "'Smells like man, and yet not quite like man,' whispered Truffle Hunter. "'It's getting steadily nearer,' said Camillo. Two badgers and you three dwarfs, with your bows at the ready, "'go softly off to meet it,' said Caspian. "'We'll settle him,' said a black dwarf grimly, fitting a shaft to his bowstring. "'Don't shoot if it is alone,' said Caspian. "'Catch it.' "'Why?' asked the dwarf. "'Do as you're told,' said Glenstorm the Suncher. Everyone waited in silence while the three dwarfs and two badgers trotted stealthily across to the trees on the northwest side of the lawn. Then came a sharp, dwarfish cry. Stop! Who goes there? And a sudden spring. A moment later, a voice, which Caspian knew well, could be heard saying, All right, all right, I'm unarmed. Take my wrists if you like, worthy badgers, but don't bite right through them. I want to speak to the king. Dr. Cornelius, cried Caspian with joy, and rushed forward to greet his old master. Everyone else crowded round. Pa, said Nickabrick, a renegade dwarf, a half and halfer. Shall I pass my sword through its throat? Be quiet, Nickabrick, said Trumpkin. The creature can't help its ancestry. This is my greatest friend and the savior of my life, said Caspian, and anyone who doesn't like his company may leave my army at once. Dearest doctor, I am glad to see you again. However did you find us out? By a little use of simple magic, your majesty, said the doctor, who was still puffing and blowing from having walked so fast. But there's no time to go into that now. We must all fly from this place at once. You are already betrayed and Miraz is on the move. Before midday tomorrow, you will be surrounded. Betrayed, said Caspian, and by whom? Another renegade dwarf, no doubt, said Nickabrick. 
by your horse, Destrier, said Dr. Cornelius. The poor brute knew no better. When you were knocked off, of course he went dawdling back to his stable in the castle. Then the secret of your flight was known. I made myself scarce, having no wish to be questioned about it in Miraz's tor torture chamber. I had a pretty good guess from my crystal as to where I should find you. But all day, that was the day before yesterday, I saw Miraz's tracking parties out in the woods. Yesterday I learned that his army is out. I don't think some of your, um, pure-blooded dwarfs have as much woodcraft as might be expected. You've left tracks all over the place. Great carelessness. At any rate, something has warned Miraz that old Narnia is not so dead as he had hoped, and he is on the move. Hurrah, said a very shrill and small voice from somewhere at the doctor's feet. Let them come. All I ask is that the king will put me and my people in the front. What on earth? said Dr. Cornelius. Has your majesty got grasshoppers or mosquitoes in your army? Then after stooping down and peering carefully through his spectacles, he broke into a laugh. A laugh. By the lion, he swore, it's a mouse. It's in your mouse. I desire your better acquaintance. I am honored by meeting so valiant a beast. My friendship you shall have, learned man, piped Reby Cheap, and any dwarf or giant in the army who does not give you good language shall have my sword to reckon with. Is there time for this foolery, asked Nickabrick? What are the plans? Battle or flight? Battle if need be, said Trumpkin, but we har are hardly ready for it yet, and this is no very defensible face place. I don't like the idea of running away, said Caspian. Hear him, hear him, said the bulgy bears. Whatever we do, don't let's have any running, especially not before supper, and not too soon after it either. Those who run first do not always run last, said the center. And why should we let the enemy choose our position instead of choosing it ourselves? Let us find a strong place. That's wise, your majesty. That's wise, said Truffle Hunter. But where are we to go? asked several voices. Your majesty said Mr. Cornelius and all you variety of creatures. I think we must fly east and down the river to the great woods. The Telmarines hate that region. They have always been afraid of the sea and of something that may come over the sea. That is why they have let the great woods grow up. If traditions speak true, the ancient Care Paravel was at the river mouth. All that part is friendly to us and hateful to our enemy. We must go to Aslan's How. Aslan's How? said several voices. We do not know what it is. It lies within the skirts of the great woods, and it is a huge mound which Narnians raised in very ancient times over a very magical place, where there stood, and perhaps still stands, a very magical stone. The mound is all hollowed out within into galleries and caves, and the stone is in the central cave of all. There is, a room, there is room in the mound for all our stores, and those of us who have most need of cover and are most accustomed to underground life can be lodged in the caves. The rest of us can lie in the wood. At a pinch, all of us, except this worthy giant, could retreat into the mound itself, and there we should be beyond the reach of every danger, except famine. It is a good thing we have a learned man among us, said Truffle Hunter, but Trumpkin muttered under his breath, Soup and celery. I wish our leaders would think less about these old wives' tales and more about victuals and arms. But all approved of Cornelius' proposal, and that very night, half an hour later, they were on the march. Before sunrise, they arrived at Aslan's Howe. It certainly was an awesome place, a round green hill on top of another hill, long since grown over with trees, and one little low doorway leading into it. The tunnels inside were a perfect maze till you got to know them, and they were lined and roofed with smooth stones. And on the stones, peering in the twilight, Caspian saw strange characters and snaky patterns and pictures in which the form of a lion was repeated again and again. It all seemed to belong to an even older Narnia than the Narnia of which his nurse had told him. It was after they had taken up their quarters in and around the how that fortune began to turn against them. King Merez's scouts soon found their new lair, and he and his army arrived on the edge of the woods. And as so often happens, the army turned out stronger than they had reckoned. Caspian's heart sank as he saw company after company arriving. And though Merez's men may have been afraid of going into the wood, they were even more afraid of Merez, and with him in command, they carried carried battle deeply into it, and sometimes almost to the how itself. Caspian and other captains, of course, made many sorties into the open country. Thus there was fighting on most days, and sometimes by night as well, but Caspian's party had on the whole the worst of it. 
At last, there came a night when everything is gone as badly as possible, and the rain which had been falling heavily all day had ceased at nightfall, only to give place to raw cold. That morning, Caspian had arranged what was his biggest battle yet, and all had hung their hopes on it. He, with most of the dwarfs, was to have fallen on the king's right wing at daybreak, and then, when they were heavily engaged, giant Wimbleweather, with the centers and some of the fiercest beasts, was to have broken out from another place and endeavored to cut the king's right off from the rest of the army. But it had all failed. No one had warned Caspian, because no one in these later days of Narnia remembered, that giants are not at all clever. Poor Wimbleweather, though as brave as a lion, was a true giant in that respect. He had broken out at the wrong time and from the wrong place, and both his party and Caspian's had suffered badly and done the enemy little harm. The best of the bears had been hurt, a center terribly wounded, and there were few in Caspian's party who had not lost blood. It was a gloomy company that huddled under the dripping trees to eat their scanty supper. The gloomiest of all was giant Wimbleweather. He knew it was all his fault. He sat in silence, shedding big tears which collected on the end of his nose, and then fell off with a huge splash on the whole bivouac of the mice, who had just been beginning to get warm and drowsy. They all jumped up, shaking the water out of their ears and wringing their little blankets, and asked the giant in shrill but forcible voices whether he thought there weren't, they weren't wet enough without this sort of thing. And then other people woke up and told the mice they had been enrolled, had been enrolled as scouts and not as a concert party, and asked why they wouldn't keep quiet. And Wimbleweather tiptoed away to find some place where he could be miserable in peace and stepped on somebody's tail. And somebody, they said afterward it was a fox, bit him. And so everyone was out of temper. But in the secret and magical chamber at the heart of the how, King Caspian with Cornelius and the Badger and Nickabrick and Trumpkin were at council. Thick pillars of ancient workmanship supported the roof. In the center was the stone itself. A stone table split right down the center and covered with what had once been writing of some kind. But ages of wind and rain and snow had almost worn them away in old times when the stone table had stood on the hilltop and the mound had not yet been built above it. They were not using the table nor sitting around it. It was too magic a thing for any common use. They sat on logs a little way from it, and between them was a rough wooden table on which stood a rude clay lamp lighting up their pale faces and throwing big shadows on the wall. If your majesty is ever to use the horn, said Truffle Hunter, I think the time has now come. Caspian, of course, told them of this treasure several days ago. We are certainly in great need, answered Caspian, but it is hard to be sure we are at our greatest, supposing there came an even worse need and we had already used it. By that argument, said Nickabrick, your majesty will never use it until it is too late. I agree with that, said Master Cornelius. And what do you think, Trumpkin? asked Caspian. Oh, as for me, said the Red Dwarf, who had been listening with complete indifference, your majesty knows I think the horn and that bit of broken stone over there and your great King Peter and your lion Aslan are all eggs and moonshine. It's all one to me when your majesty blows the horn. All I insist is that the army is told nothing about it. There is no good raising hopes of magical help, which, as I think, are sure to be disappointed. Then in the name of Aslan, we will win Queen Susan's horn, said Caspian. There is one thing, sire, said Dr. Cornelius, that should perhaps be done first. We do not know what form the help will take. It might call Aslan himself from oversea, but I think it is more likely to call Peter the High King and his mighty consorts down from the high past. But in either case, I do not think we can be sure that the help will come to this very spot. You never said a truer word, put in Trumpkin. I think, went on the learned man, that they, or he, will come back to one or other of the ancient places of Narnia. This, where we now sit, is the most ancient and most deeply magical of all, and here, I think, the answer is likeliest to come. But there are two others. One is Lantern Waste, upriver, west of Beaver's Dam, where the royal children first appeared in Narnia, as the records tell. Where the... There, the other is down at the river mouth, where their castle of Caraparavel once stood. And if Aslan himself comes, that would be the best place for meeting him, too. For every story says that he is the son of the great emperor over the sea, and over the sea he will pass. I should like very much to send messengers to both places, to Lantern Waste and the river mouth, to receive them, or him, or it. Just as I thought, muttered Trumpkin. The first result of all this foolery is not to bring us help, but to lose us two fighters. Whom would you think of sending? Dr. Cornelius asked Caspian. 
Squirrels are best for getting through enemy country without being caught, said Truffle Hunter. All our squirrels, and ha we haven't many, said Nickabrick, are rather flighty. The only one I'd trust in a job like that would be Patter Twig. Let it be Patter Twig, then, said King Caspian. And who for our other messenger? I know you'd go, Truffle Hunter, but you haven't the speed. Nor you, Dr. Cornelius. I won't go, said Nickabrick. With all these humans and beasts about, there must be a dwarf here to see that the dwarfs are fairly treated. Thimbles and thunderstorms, cried Trumpkin in a rage. Is that how you speak to the king? Send me, sire. I'll go. But I thought you didn't believe in the horn, Trumpkin, said Caspian. No more I do, your majesty. But what's that got to do with it? I might as well die in a wild goose chase as die here. You are my king. I know the difference between giving advice and taking orders. You've had my advice, and now it's the time for orders. I will never forget this, Trumpkin, said Caspian. Send for Pattertwig, one of you. And when shall I blow the horn? I would wait for sunrise, your majesty, said Master Cornelius. That sometimes has an effect in operations of white magic. A few minutes later, Pattertwig arrived and had his task explained to him. As he was, like many squirrels, full of courage and dash and energy and excitement and mischief, not to say conceit, he had no sooner heard it than he was eager to be off. It was arranged that he should run for Lantern Waste, while Trumpkin made the shorter journey to the river mouth. After a hasty meal, they both set off with the fervent thanks and good wishes of the king, the badger, and Cornelius. Chapter 8 How They Left the Island and so, said Trumpkin, for as you have realized, it was he who had been telling all this story to the four children, sitting on the grass in the ruined hall of Caraparavel. And so I put a crust or two in my pocket, left behind all weapons but my dagger, and took to the woods in the gray of the morning. I had been plugging away for many hours when there came a sound that I had never heard the like of in my born days. Eh, I won't forget that. The whole air was full of it, loud as thunder, but far longer, cool and sweet as music over water but strong enough to shake the woods. And I said to myself, if that's not the horn, call me a rabbit. And a moment later, I wondered why he hadn't blown it sooner. What time was it? asked Edmund. Between nine and ten of the clock, said Trumpkin. Just when we were at the railway station, said all the children, and looked at one another with shining eyes. Please go on, said Lucy to the dwarf. Well, as I was saying, I wondered, but I went on as hard as I could pelt. I kept on all night, and then, when it was half light this morning, as, as if I'd no more sense than a giant, I risked a short cut across open country to cut off a big loop of the river, and was caught. Not by the army, but by a pompous old fool who has charge of a little castle which is mirrors his last stronghold towards the coast. I needn't tell you they got new tru no true tale out of me. But I was a dwarf, and that was enough. But lobsters and lollipops. It was a good thing the sentinel was a pompous fool. Anyone else would have run me through there and them. But nothing would do for him short of a grand execution, sending me down to the ghosts in the full ceremonial way. And then this young lady, he nodded at Susan, does her bit of archery, and it was pretty shooting, let me tell you. And here we are, and without my armor, for of course they took that, he knocked out and refilled his pipe. Great Scott, said Peter. So it was the horn, your own horn, Sue, that dragged us all off that seat on the platform yesterday morning. I can hardly believe it, yet it all fits in. I don't know why you shouldn't believe it, said Lucy, if you believe in magic at all. Aren't there lots of stories about magic forcing people out of one place, out of one world, into another? I mean, when a magician in the Arabian Nights called up a djinn, it had to, has to come. We had to come, just like that. Yes, said Peter, I suppose what makes it feel so queer is that in the stories, it's always someone in our world who does the calling. One doesn't really think about where the djinn's coming from. And now, we, knows what it, we know what it feels like for the djinn, said Edmund with a chuckle. Golly, it's a bit uncomfortable to know that we can be whistled for like that. It's worse than what Father says about living at the mercy of the telephone. But we want to be here, don't we, said Lucy, if Aslan wants us? Meanwhile, said the dwarf, what are we to do? I suppose I'd better go back to King Caspian and tell him no help has come. No help, said Susan, but it has worked, and here we are. Um, um, yes, to be sure, I see that, said the dwarf, whose pipe seemed to be blocked. At any rate, he made himself very busy cleaning it. 
But, well, I mean... But don't you see who we are, shouted Lucy? You are stupid. I suppose you are the four children out of the old story, said Trumpkin. And I'm very glad to meet you, of course. And it's very interesting, no doubt. But no offense. And he hesitated again. Do get on and say whatever you're going to say, said Edmund. Well, then, no offense, said Trumpkin. But you know, the king and truffle hunter and Master Cornelius were expecting, well, if you see what I mean, help. To put it another way, I think they've been imagining you as great warriors. As it is, we're awfully fond of children and all that, but just at the moment in the middle of a war, but I'm sure you understand. You mean you think we're no good, said Edmund, getting red in the face. Now pray, don't be offended, interrupted the dwarf. I assure you, my dear little friends, little from you is a really a bit too much, said Edmund, jumping up. I suppose you don't believe we won the Battle of Baruna? Well, you can say what you like about me because I know there's no good losing our tempers, said Peter. Let's fit him out with fresh armor and fit ourselves from the treasure chamber and have a talk after that. I don't quite see the point, began Edmund, but Lucy whispered in his ear, hadn't we better do what Peter says? He is the high king, you know, and I think he has an idea. So Edmund agreed and by the aid of his torch, they all, including Ed, including Trumpkin, went down the steps again into the dark coldness and dusty splendor of the treasure house. The dwarf's eyes glistened as it saw the wealth that lay on the shelves, though it had to stand on tiptoe to do so, and it muttered to itself, it would never do to let Nickabrick see this. Never. They found easily enough a mail shirt for him, a sword, a helmet, a shield, a bow and quiver full of arrows, all of dwarfish size. The helmet was of copper, set with rubies, and there was gold on the hilt of the sword. Trumpkin had never seen, much less carried, so much wealth in all his life. The children also put on mail shirts and helmets. A sword and shield were found for Edmund and a bow for Lucy. Peter and Susan were, of course, already carrying their gifts. As they came back up the stairway, jingling in their mail and already looking and feeling more like Narnians and less like school children, the two boys were behind, apparently making some plan. Lucy heard Edmund say, No, let me do it. It will be more of a sucks for him if I win, and less of a letdown for all of us if I fail. All right, Ed, said Peter. When they came out into the daylight, Edmund turned to the dwarf very politely and said, I've got something to ask you. Kids like us don't often have the chance of meeting a great warrior like you. Would you have a little fencing match with me? It would be frightfully decent. But lad, said Trumpkin, these swords are sharp. I know, said Edmund, but I'll never get anywhere near you, and you'll be quite clever enough to disarm me without doing me any damage. It's a dangerous game, said Trumpkin, but since you make such a point out of it, I'll try a pass or two. Both swords were out in a moment, and the three others jumped off the dais and stood watching. It was well worth it. It was not like the silly fighting you see with broadswords on the stage. It was not even like the rapier fighting, which you sometimes see rather better done. This was real broadsword fighting. The great thing is to slash at your enemy's legs and feet because they are the parts that have no armor. When he slashes at yours, you jump with both feet off the ground so that his blow goes under them. This gave the dwarf an advantage because Edmund, being much taller, had to be always stooping. I don't think Edmund would have had a chance if he had fought Trumpkin 24 hours earlier. But the air of Narnia had been working upon him ever since they arrived on the island, and all his old battles came back to him, and his arms and fingers remembered their old skill. He was King Edmund once more. Round and round the two combatants circled, stroke after stroke they gave, and Susan, who never could learn to like this sort of thing, shouted out, Oh, do be careful! And then, so quickly that no one, unless they knew as Peter did, could quite see how it happened, Edmund flashed his sword round with a peculiar twist, the dwarf's sword flew out of his grip, and Trumpkin was wringing his empty hand as you do after the sting from a cricket bat. Not hurt, I hope, my dear little friend, said Edmund, panting a little and returning his own sword to its sheath. I see the point, said Trumpkin dryly. You know a trick I never learn. That's quite true, put in Peter. The best swordsman in the world may be disarmed by a trick that's new to him. I think it's only fair to give Ch Trumpkin a chance at something else. Will you have a shooting match with my sister? There are no tricks in archery, you know. Ah, uh, you're jokers, you are, said the dwarf. I begin to see, as if I didn't know how she can shoot after what happened this morning. All the same, I'll have a try. 
He spoke gruffly, but his eyes brightened, for he was a famous bowman among his own people. All five of them came out into the courtyard. "'What's to be the target?' said Peter. "'I think that apple hanging over the wall on the branch there would do,' said Susan. "'That'll do nicely, lass,' said Trumpkin. "'You mean the yellow one near the middle of the arch?' "'No, not that,' said Susan. "'The red one up above, over the battlement.' The dwarf's face fell. "'Looks more like a cherry than an apple,' he muttered, but he said nothing out loud. They tossed up for first shot, greatly to the interest of Trumpkin, who had never seen a coin toss before. And Susan lost. They were to shoot from the top of the steps that led from the hall into the courtyard. Everyone could see from the way the dwarf took his position and handled the bow that it knew what it was about. Twang went the string. It was an excellent shot. The tiny apple shook as the arrow passed, and a leaf came fluttering down. Then Susan went to the top of the steps and strung her bow. She was not enjoying her match half so much as Edmund had enjoyed his, not because she had any doubt about hitting the apple, but because Susan was so tender-hearted that she almost hated to beat someone who had been beaten already. The dwarf watched her keenly as she drew the shaft to her ear. A moment later, with a little soft thump which they all could hear in that quiet place, the apple fell to the grass with Susan's arrow in it. "'Oh, well done, Sue!' shouted the other children. It wasn't really any better than yours, said Susan to the dwarf. I think there was a tiny breath of wind you shot. As you shot. No, there wasn't, said Trumpkin. Don't tell me. I know when I am fairly beaten. I won't even say that the scar of my last wound catches me a bit when I get my arm well back. Oh, are you wounded? asked Lucy. Do let me look. It's not a sight for little girls, began Trumpkin. But then he suddenly checked himself. There I go, talking like a fool again, he said. I suppose you're as likely to be a great surgeon as your brother was to be a great swordsman, or your sister to be a great archer. He sat down on the steps and took off his hybrid and slipped down his little shirt, showing an arm hairy and muscular in proportion as a sailor's, though not much bigger than a child's. There was a clumsy bandage on the shoulder, which Lucy proceeded to unroll. Underneath, the cut looked very nasty, and there was a good deal of swelling. Oh, poor Trumpkin, said Lucy. How horrid. Then she carefully dripped on to it one single drip, of the cordial from her flask. Hello? Eh? What have you done? said Trumpkin. But Auer returned his head and squinted and whisked his beard to and fro. He couldn't quite see his own shoulder. Then he felt it as well as he could, getting his arms and fingers into very difficult positions as you do when you're trying to scratch a place that is just out of reach. Then he swung his arm and raised it and tried the muscles and finally jumped to his feet, crying, Giants and junipers! It's cured! It's as good as new. After that, he burst into a great laugh and said, Well, I've made as big a fool of myself as ever a dwarf did. No offense, I hope. My humble duty to your majesty's all. Humble duty. And thanks for my life, my cure, my breakfast, and my lesson. The children all said it was quite all right, and not to mention it. And now, said Peter, if you've really decided to believe in us. I have, said the dwarf. It's quite clear what we have to do. We must join King Caspian at once. The sooner the better, said Trumpkin. My being such a fool has already wasted about an hour. It's about two days' journey, the way you came, said Peter. For us, I mean. We can't walk all day and night like you dwarfs. Then he turned to the others. What Trumpkin calls Aslan's How is obviously the stone table itself. You remember it was about a half day's march, or a little less, from there down to the fords of Baruna. Baruna's bridge, we call it, said Trumpkin. There was no bridge in our time, said Peter. And then from Baruna down to here was another day and a bit. We used to get home about tea time on the second day, going easily. Going hard, we could do the whole thing in a day and a half, perhaps. But remember, it's all woods now, said Trumpkin, and there are enemies to dodge. Look here, said Edmund. Needn't we go by the same way that our dear little friend came? No more of that, your majesty, if you love me, said the dwarf. Very well, said Edmund. May I say our DLF? Oh, Edmund, said Susan, don't keep on him like that. That's all right, lass. I mean your majesty, said Trumpkin with a chuckle. A jibe won't raise a blister. And after, after that, they often called him the DLF till they almost forgot what it meant. As I was saying, continued Edmund, we needn't go that way. Why shouldn't we row a little south till we come to Glasswater Creek and row up it? That brings us up behind the hill of the stone table, and we'll be safe while we're at sea. If we start at once, we can be at the head of Glasswater before dark, get a few hours sleep, and be with Caspian pretty early tomorrow. What a thing it is to know the coast, said Trumpkin. None of us know anything about Glasswater. 
What about food? asked Susan. Oh, we'll have to do with apples, said Lucy. Do let's get on. We've done nothing yet, and we've been here nearly two days. And anyway, no one's going to have my hat for a fish basket again, said Edmund. They used one of the raincoats as a kind of bag and put a good many apples in it. Then they had all had a good long drink at the well, for they would meet no more fresh water till they landed at the head of the creek, and went down to the boat. The children were sorry to leave Caraparavel, which, even in ruins, had begun to feel like home again. The DLF had better steer, said Peter, and Ed and I will take an oar each. Half a moment, though. We'd better take off our mail. We're going to be pretty warm before we're done. The girls had better be in the bows and shout directions to the DLF, because he doesn't know the way. You'd better get us a far way, fair way out to sea till we've passed the, land, uh, the island. And soon the green wooded coast of the island was falling away behind them, and its little bays and headlands were beginning to look flatter, and the boat was rising and falling in the gentle swell. The sea began to grow bigger around them and in the distance bluer, but close round the boat it was green and bubbly. Everything smelled salt, and there was no noise except the swishing of water and the clap-clap of water against the sides and the splash of the oars and the jolting noise of the rowlocks. The sun grew, lot, grew hot. It was delightful for Lucy and Susan and the bows bending over the edge and trying to get their hands in the sea, which they could never quite reach. The bottom, mostly pure, pale sand, but with occasional patches of purple seaweed, could be seen beneath them. "'It's like old times,' said Lucy. "'Do you remember our voyage to Terebinthia and Gelma and Seven Isles and the Lone Islands?' "'Yes,' said Susan, "'and our great ship, the Splendor Hyaline, with the swans headed her prow and the carved swan's wing coming back almost to her waist, and the silken sails and the great stern lanterns, and the feast on the poop and the magicians. Do you remember?' When we had the musicians up in the rigging playing flutes, so it sounded like music out of the sky. Presently, Susan took over Edmund's oar, and he came forward to join Lucy. They passed the island now and stood closer into the shore, all wooded and deserted. They would have thought it very pretty if they had not remembered the time when it was open and breezy and full of merry friends. Phew, this is pretty grueling work, said Peter. Can't I row for a bit, said Lucy. The oars are too big for you, said Peter shortly, not because he was cross, but because he had no strength to spare for talking. And that's all for today. Thank you.